Hello and welcome to Unramblings, a podcast about stories and storytelling. I'm Faye Fix. And I'm Charlene. And this week we're talking about Mistborn, or The Final Empire, which is book one in Mistborn but was originally published as Mistborn. It has a name change in there somewhere. It's very confusing. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be really hard for everyone to adjust. For listeners who might not be familiar with us or are listening to this at a later date, you might notice that that name that I'm using is different to the one in the first 25 episodes. Unless you are listening to them backwards, in which case you're about to get very confused. I have changed my name to be more in line with my gender identity. You can find more about that on our social media and on my blog. In keeping with that, this week we're coming to you on our new microphones, which we're hoping will mean that we're able to record at our dining room table and come out of the closet. (laughs) We're also using some new recording software that we're hoping means that we can do some slightly better things with our sound quality, so hopefully this will sound a lot better than the previous episodes. If not, we may have to go back to recording somewhere else. We'll work that out. But it's also going to be my first time using said new recording software so we'll see how well it goes it'll be fine okay so this week we're talking about Mistborn, which was later renamed the final empire so that the trilogy could be called Mistborn by brandon sanderson the first book that he had published so it's an earlier work by him he's well known now for the way of kings which i believe is being made into a tv series i think so yeah Cool. So obviously we're going to be spoiling the first book. I've only read the first book. Charlene has read more of them before, but hasn't read some of them in a while. So the plan is to read through these and do them in several parts with me only knowing about the current book and Charlene having an idea about the future books, but not talking about that. So she can just be quietly smug when I say something stupid that gets counteracted in a later book. That means that we shouldn't be spoiling anything from the later books. But we might have a section where I'm trying to predict what might happen in those later books. So there's a risk that I might spoil something by being right. If we have any more less confusing spoiler warnings, we'll drop those in right here along with any content warning. Hello, we're pretty light on the whole spoiler warnings this week. In fact, I don't think we have any. We're also pretty light on content warnings. There are some passing mentions of rape and murder, but not in any detail. And I think that's pretty much it. Welcome back. Okay, so shall we get into it? Mm-hmm. We're going to try something a little bit different this week. Usually we record a plot summary and you don't get to hear it usually, but what happens is whenever I do it, Charlene cuts in every 15 seconds correcting me on something and it takes us about 10 minutes to record it. So this week we're going to try me recording my plot summary and then Charlene is going to record her own plot summary where she adds in all the things that I've got wrong. Is that fair? Sure. So Mistborn is the story of the Scar Rebellion a worker slave class that has been subjugated for the last thousand or so years by the magical Lord Ruler of the Final Empire. It's led by the figure of Kelsia, who is a Mistborn who can do all kinds of magic, whereas most people can only do little bits of magic or no magic at all. And it also includes Vin, the plucky street urchin, who can also do all of the magics because she's the chosen one or something. I'm not sure. Uh, She's very powerful. The book goes through how a sort of traditional con thieving crew ends up being the heart of this rebellion and their different skills playing into this steady building up of this sort of mythos around Kelsia that enables them to really get all the disenfranchised, (laughs) giving them something to believe in and help them to throw off this oppressive regime. I'm sure none of this sounds at all familiar to anyone at the moment. And um, and then they do it. They win. Yay! Well, okay, there's some other bits where, you know, Kelsia dies to be a martyr and create his own religion and Finn ends up fighting the Lord Ruler and there's a whole lot to get into. I could give a three-hour plot summary. It's, it's a full fantasy book. It's a whole world. Was this any use at all? I think so. I think maybe we should go back to you interrupting me. Just letting me talk is not a good idea. So should I try and summarize it now? Are you going to summarize it or are you going to put in all the important points that I missed? I mean, I was going to summarize it, okay, you but said. just differently. Okay. You. You, you, you give your perspective. Okay, so in Mistborn, we follow Vin, who is a young, basically like a street urchin person, like you said. Now, can you steal my words? Is this allowed? We I think it's allowed, okay. if they're appropriate words. Anyway, she is part of the underclass of the society in this world, uh, which is, has the ska and the nobles, and that's sort of like a feudalism type situation presided over by the Lord Ruler, who saved the world about a thousand years ago and has pretty much ruled it with an iron fist ever since. 
the nobles are descended from the people who supported him a thousand years ago, and the Ska are the descendants of everyone else, and it, it has become a very polarized society. Um, the magic in this society is based on metals and being able to like eat them and use them to create different magic. At least this is what, what Allomancy is. And Vin and Kelsier, who Faithfix mentioned earlier, are mistborn, which means they can use all the different known metals, allomantic metals, to do different things to interact with the world and other people. And the Lord Ruler also can do these things. But only nobles are supposed to have these abilities. So this is kind of a problem for Kelsier and Vin and their crew, who are Ska and like half Ska people who have allomantic abilities and run a, th a premium thieving crew. And they decide to organize the Ska rebellion and once and for all try and galvanize the people to try and rise up and form a more equal society. That involves Vin going undercover as a noblewoman, uh, which results in the enlisting of support of certain nobles who have been wondering if Ska are real people, basically, and who also have issues with the Lord Ruler's despotic and authoritarian regime. They are successful in um, overthrowing the Lord Ruler, partially through Vin having a showdown with him and realizing that he's using a different form of magic than people understood. Kelsier does martyr himself as part of the way to galvanize the Ska. He doesn't murder himself. Martyr himself. Martyr himself. Okay, well, that makes sense. Martyrs sense. himself as part of his plot to actually get enough of a following of the Ska to get them to have enough hope to participate fully in the rebellion, which they had been hesitant to do prior. You feel like that covers everything? Well, no, I mean, there's another sort of 550 pages that we didn't touch on, but I think it's hit the key elements here. Yeah. If you want a more complete summary, read the book. Yep, it's a good book. I tried really hard to not get into any of the larger world stuff that I vaguely remember from having read the trilogy in its entirety years ago. Although there's a confusion because there's now a second trilogy. And several different books that are all part of this universe, many of which take place on different worlds in that same universe. Mistborn is part of the Cosmere, which is a universe of Brandon Sanderson's dividing, devising that includes many worlds. I think that we've committed to the first three Mistborn books. Yeah. I, yeah. Anyway, shall we get into it? Sure. So I thought we'd start off with something fairly light this week, sort of a fairly airy topic, no real world concerns, just... Um, I feel like the book sort of portrays this issue of classism and this issue of racism as being intertwined, and I thought that was really interesting. It definitely is set up that way, as I said in my plot summary, like it is a feudal society where you have this noble class and this underclass who exists to serve the needs of the noble upper class people who literally view the peasants as a different race of humans, even though that's clearly not the case. Like interbreeding is possible and happens all, all the time, despite their rigorous attempts to prevent it by murdering any ska woman that a noble sleeps with. Like it's totally fine to sleep with your ska, but you have to murder them afterwards. And that's really fucked up. And the, the fact that that's even a thing like is biologically like that you, you're the same species. <laughs> Yeah, um, just in case anyone thinks I'm an asshole, that was definitely a tongue-in-cheek introduction to this topic. Yeah. But I do want to clarify that they do that because they don't want the Ska to develop the magical abilities that the Lord Ruler decided only his friends and their descendants, the nobles, should have, which is the Allomancy. Um, so they're trying to keep a particular type of power out of the hands of the common people to prevent them from having the mobility and the leverage to be able to make changes in that society. Yeah, I mean, so this is obviously set up as uh, parallel to things from our own world. Um, we've talked a little bit before about how we see science fiction and fantasy functioning as stories, as them often being a way to create a parallel world to highlight various problems that exist within our own. I think that a lot of the stuff with the SCAR is almost lazily a commentary on American slavery. Yeah, I think... That's a little bit judgmental of phrasing in terms of saying lazily, well, but there's definitely clear allusions to ideas that were used to justify slavery, like a whole lot of bullshit pseudoscience that was meant to prove that black people weren't as intelligent as white people, et cetera, yeah. and that 
their condition was improved by the civilizing influence, quote unquote, of being enslaved, which is, of course, bullshit and just justification of an abhorrent practice. But it was nonetheless used at the time. And you see parallels there in terms of the very well-meaning nobles, um, Ellen and his friend, who are like the philosopher rich kids who are having these academic conversations about whether or not Ska are as intelligent and have the same potential as nobles. And Ellen wants to investigate this, but his social class prevents him from doing that. So, but it's one of the first things he thinks about when he finds out that Vin is a Ska is that it vindicates all of his suspicions about the false nature of that divide. I would say that that's a little bit unfair on Brandon Sanderson because I think he does a really good job of showing Ellen's difficulty to go against that implicit bias he's been raised with in that his first reaction is, oh God, she's a Scar. And then it's a later thought that it's, but hang on, she was able to match wits with me. And like, mm-hmm. she she sure didn't seem like some dumb Scar. Well, maybe what they say about Scar isn't true. Like he has a complete thought process that he doesn't turn on a dime. We've seen that he's receptive to those ideas before. Mm-hmm. But it still takes him a moment to reevaluate his entire everything he's been told. Well, in like their early meetings, he's asking Vin about the ska in the plantations because he is curious about the ability and like intelligence of ska because he thinks they might be just as intelligent as nobles, but he has no way of investigating that. Well, he's open to the possibility that it might be the case, but he asks it as a philosophical question. Right. But of course, Vin's like undercover and doesn't want to blow her cover. So she's like, eh, I don't know, probably not. They're dumb ska or whatever. Um, blows it off. And it, it's one of those moments where you're like frustrated at characters. who are like, oh, you're missing an opportunity here. You're missing what this person is trying to get at. Yeah. And that could have been an ally even sooner. So I want to talk a little bit about how they do draw these distinctions. Mm-hmm. Or not so much how they draw these distinctions, but draw the way that this divide is within the society by showing you a lot of different perspectives. Because Vin is sort of brought into this world of the thieving crew and of the nobles, having had a very limited perspective before. And to some extent, we spend the novel following her on her own discovery of what is nobles versus Scar. What does Mm -hmm. that mean and what should it mean? And it's notable that she changes Kelsey's mind on that, which we can get to in a minute. Certainly the first point of view that we're given on the whole situation is Mm Kelsey's, which is nobles should be dead. Mm -hmm. The only good noble is a dead noble. He really thinks they're all irredeemable monsters, like from the beginning. Does not see any potential in any of them for compassion or growth or any sort of recognition of Ska as human beings. Yeah, when the idea that maybe this noble is good, when Vin's trying to be like, Alan seems like a nice guy, his response is, no, he's a noble, therefore he's a monster. Mm -hmm. Um, And don't get me wrong, it seems as though a good percentage of them are, and like, for example, knowingly sleep with Ska women, knowing that they will then be killed for being slept with. It's terrible. I mean, I suppose we should really be very clear. Raping their ska slaves and then murdering them. Yes. And I want to clarify that all parts of that are terrible, not just the killing afterwards, which mm-hmm. is, the, that's the part that people really get down on. It's like, oh, you kill your the people that you've raped? Well, that's pretty bad. Content one is going to be fun it's this episode. all bad. All terrible. Hot take. <laughs> um, the other end of the spectrum that we get for perspectives is obviously Elland, mm-hmm. who's coming into it as a noble. He still thinks nobles aren't great. I think Elland is a great example of something that's come up before in um, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is definitely going to be linked in the, the show notes again. I know it was linked before, and I think the Steven Universe episode, but it bears repeating. One of the big points in that is you can't truly be an ally and completely engage with the effort to help with the fight against oppression unless you yourself put yourself in the place and the vulnerable position of the oppressed. Like you can't stay in your privileged position, safe from the things that 
the people you're trying to work with are dealing with in joining their cause, you will be vulnerable in the same way that they are. And Ellen takes that on and he does it willingly and with his eyes open, like he stays during the riots and he decides to join the rebellion and he offers to liaise with the rebellion, basically between them and the nobles, knowing he'll be seen as a class traitor and that he might be killed. But he decides to do that because he recognizes the humanity in the people that he has been complicit in the oppression of. That's fair. I mean, when his father leaves, his father is very much of the opinion of Sure, stay here and die. That'll make life easier for me. And then when he is rescuing Vin from the fortress, he runs into that battle ready to die. Mm -hmm. It's it's a surprise that he comes out of it alive to everyone, including him. Yeah, Um, and he runs in taking on that same risk, knowing that it doesn't matter if he's a noble when he's going to attack the Lord Ruler or going to rescue the person who's attacking the Lord Ruler. As far as the Lord Ruler and his guards are concerned... He is, you know, just as worthy of being killed for that as any ska. But he's the voice that means that we don't get a different form of, I'm going to say genocide. I mean, obviously they're not different races, but Mm -hmm. sort of how it's being perceived in the world. It's not murder every noble in the city. It's It's still genocide. I mean, we have genocide. We're all the same race. Well, biologically. He's able to see shades of gray where Kelsey's experiences have put it very much into black and white. Well, I think he's able to see that it's a culture issue, not an inherent issue of the organism. It's not that nobles are fundamentally monstrous with the incapability of seeing the Scot as human. It's that they've been raised and taught in this culture that indoctrinates them into these ideas, which is, exact, again, an excellent parallel to white supremacy. They are raised thinking they're superior. We're raised with all sorts of signals telling us that we as white people are superior, and that's bullshit. Bullshit, but that's something you have to unlearn when it's something you've been learning in so many ways, often very subtle ways, your entire life. So I think um, a couple of the other sectors that we get are, that are good for this is there's the sort of midpoint characters with Doxon and Marsh, both being Scar that are portraying nobles in various roles, but they are, unlike Vin, who is coming fairly blind into these situations have been doing this for a long time, have known nobles in a variety of ways. And it leaves both of them with a certain hesitance, I think. Like, Doxon is still with Kelsia for things, but I think he has a certain distaste for necessarily killing all nobles regardless. I don't think he has that same, the only good noble is a dead noble thing. He does try to convince Vin that Ellen isn't good, like that all nobles are bad. He does agree with Kelsier that all nobles are bad, but I think he thinks it's more of like, I think he, he also sees that it's a culture problem, but I don't think that he sees a way out of it. Sure. I think he thinks that they are all bad and there's nothing you can do to fix anybody who's been raised in that environment where they believe thoroughly that they're better than Ska and that Ska are dirt. So what's your take on Marsh then? I think Marsh and Kelsier have a very difficult position because they were raised passing as nobles. And like with them, you get into a lot of the weird mix of like poor white people type people and passing privilege. Their mother was a Ska prostitute who was passing as noble because not all the nobles are wealthy and powerful. Noble is more of a race the way we would understand it, than it is a class as we would understand it. There is stratification within that group. And so there are poor and relatively powerless nobles, but they console themselves with this idea that, well, they're at least not ska and they have the social mobility of being part of a noble group. And so their mother was passing as a noble prostitute. And then it was found out that she wasn't. Then she was killed and her people started going after her kids. So they had a pretty privileged existence for a while. And then sort of the curtain kind of fell down, etc. Um, so I think that they are they have, I think, some more bitterness toward the noble cast because they Mm -hmm. felt accepted by it at one point there was a part they were educated and they were accepted to a degree until they weren't 
So there's an element of betrayal there that isn't there when you're born on the streets as a ska, told with every breath that you're nothing and you have no reason to expect anything else, which is where Vin is starting and where Doxon starts as a plantation ska. Yeah. It definitely reminds me of, it's the the greatest trick, I can't remember the phrasing, but it's like the greatest trick that um, basically the wealthy elite ever pulled was convincing poor white people that they had more in common with rich white people than they did with black and brown working class people. Because anytime people who are working class and poor try to band together and like unionize and together and things like that to try and assert their collective power to challenge the authority of people who are rich and powerful. A lot of racist shit is thrown down to try and divide people from each other. And that's what you're seeing in this situation as well. Yeah. It's interesting because with that sort of situation, I think that there's an element of like when higher taxes for the rich are suggested and people who are not in those classes at all will say, oh no, we don't want that. And there's an aspect to which it's because some part of them thinks one day I could be that rich. With the scar and things, there's no suggestion that one day they can be noble. There's no upward mobility for a scar, except for the one option that there is, which is the next thing I want to talk about, which was clubs Mm -hmm. and like the clubs, the character, not Mm -hmm. clubs, the weapon, Mm -hmm. um, as sort of a model minority with his craft shop and he's sort of recognized as a master craftsman. So even though he's a scar who are supposed to be less than, well, we'll let this guy have a shop and a staff of people who can make us nice things. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to do with, he's creating value for the noble class. And so in that regard, he's still sort of operating within his quote unquote, quote, place. Mm -hmm. And so he ends up in like the top of the hierarchy he can get to the top of, but it's still below the nobles. Yes. Yeah. He ends up being sort of the one of the good ones example in the parallel to this world. And it's just like, yeah, people acknowledge that he is a ska and that has limitations, but they also can't deny his ability, but that doesn't erase their prejudice of where he came from and who he is. Yeah, he's an interesting figure um, in that he's accepted by the nobles to a degree, but has also chosen to use that acceptance as a way to hire his shop out to thieving crews. And it's interesting to how he might have got to the position he's in. I suspect that this is something that we'll see in one of the later books. Um, as towards the end, Kelsier has left a note that clubs should be given a command and someone's like, well, why is clubs getting given a command? And it's effectively like, well, why do you think I've got a limp? He's He's been a general before in some form of Scar Rebellion that presumably didn't go well, but has then managed to settle into this position of quiet resistance. Yeah. I, I want to talk about why rebellions keep failing in this world and the magic that's used to keep them down. Can we come back around to that in a minute? Sure. So from just how the story has been put together, you have not just what would be easy to do of the main like nobles are bad, nobles are maybe not entirely bad viewpoints of Alan and Kelsey, but you have these ones in between, including people like Ham and Breeze, whose taste for murdering nobles comes and goes. And there's a certain amount of self-interest that plays into some of that. And it does let Vin sort of gather up a lot of opinions who come out at this, like, well, Ellen, we can't wait until you're, you've grown up and because uh, people will be dead by then. Mm-hmm. Um, and also what you're talking about is incremental change. We need something mm-hmm. big now. And that breadth of viewpoints that she gets is often substantiated with her going to them and having a particular conversation whether that being finding out that Ham has a family outside of the city somewhere that's kept secret in case his work goes sideways, or going and talking to Doxon about how his family was murdered before he ran off and joined a thieving crew. You get a sort of full dimension that helps to build that entire world around it. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I think the different viewpoints that go into Vin sort of making up her mind about like what she thinks of the world and what she thinks of the nature of people in this society is very valuable as a storytelling element to the reader for building the world for us. It gives you a much more nuanced idea because you're able to see not just different endpoints, but also like the different, like the textures of the different kinds of experience that kind of get you there so that you're not getting like this super black and white image, the way you might have if the whole story were told from Kelsier's perspective, for example. So we talked a little bit about Scar as being seen as less than the nobles on like an inherent basis. And that's sort of the mythos that's been put out by the Lord Ruler. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Terrasman mm-hmm. and how that plays in as this sort of third quote unquote race that mm-hmm. appears. Um, so they have a different kind of magic to what is publicly known within mm-hmm. the world. Everyone knows about Alamancy where you eat some metal and then you have magic powers. Yeah. Um, Until you use them up. Until you use them up. Assuming that you have the innate ability to be an Alamancer. Terrasman have Farukumi where they can be in contact with a piece of metal and store some sort of trait, whether that be storing up strength or youth for later by being weaker or older for a while, or by storing memories, which is a whole thing to get into. So the Lord Ruler has sort of decreed that all terrorists need to be either killed or made infertile, and there are like breeding programs to keep enough of them around to act as servants. Like really, really important, like your butler, basically. Valet. Valet, yeah. Or valet. Yeah. Gentleman, gentleman. Mm -hmm. For which they're quite prized. Like, they're considered, like, the best valets or whatever you want to call them um, that you could possibly retain. But otherwise, they seem to just be genocidally persecuted. Yep, fucked up. It is. And do they have to keep the fact that they can do Farukumi secret? Is it like some terrorismen can do it? Uh, some some terrorismen can do it. Yeah. The Lord Ruler is limiting their numbers because he is a terrorisman, but people don't know that. And he has the ability to do Farukumi, but he wants that to be like his ace in the hole that people don't know about or know what the extent of his powers are or how they work. So he wants them to be extremely limited and powerless so that they can't challenge him and people can't put things together to figure out how to challenge the Lord Ruler. So the Terrace Men have been preserving their traditions and their culture in secret through the use of Farukumi and storing of memories, but they have to keep their ability to do Farukumi and their part in doing that for the very limited numbers of their people is secret. Does that make sense? Yeah. The uh, the sort of genocidal hunting down and sterilization of them is obviously more allusions to things that white people have done in the real world, um, which I appreciate sort of there being a representation of these issues. I think that the fact that it has remained accepted for a thousand years of hunting down Terrace Moon in particular, keepers that are able to keep knowledge and things, shows how you get these biases that build up as the same people are in power for a long period of time, and then they can just become intrinsic and unquestioned after a while. Intrinsic in the culture? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's kind of like the way that people will hold up aspects of, I'm I'm sure I'll get hate mail for this, like the United States Constitution Mm -hmm. as being gospel. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, this is what the founding fathers said. And therefore it's like, "Mm, yeah, okay, the founding fathers were a few white guys 250 years ago. Maybe they were wrong. Yeah, or at least maybe not everything they wrote is going to be directly relevant to the world we're in now where there's... A, a lot has changed since yeah. then. Yeah, situations are not one to one with all of the situations foreseen in the drafting of that document, which is why they did also put in the ability to amend it. Right, um, but we've got to a position with the Lord Ruler where the way that he's using class and race has allowed for the society to just stagnate. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem to have made any huge advances or changes in the p- recent period of time because you've got to a position where A large chunk of your population is oppressed to the point that they can't do much, which we'll get into more in a moment. And then when it comes to the nobles, if they start gaining too much power, then the Lord Ruler apparently encourages a house war, at which point a large quantity of nobles kill each other off. And it sort of just resets the clock by 100 years, every 100 years or so, while the Lord Ruler isn't aging neither is the world around him. Yeah, and I want to go back to what you were saying about this idea of when one person in this, in the case of this book, or one group of people for the most part, in the case of this and many other countries around the world, where you end up with concentration of power that doesn't really change, and you end up with the, with these dynasties the way that we've ended up here and in a lot of other places where access to power has a lot to do with the family you're born into and the resources that are accessible to that family, um, leaving things very lopsided and mobility very limited in terms of the rest of the society. In this case, we have that like to an extreme because it's literally the one dude who's been in charge at the top, calling all the shots, pulling all the strings for a thousand years. And I, I really like 
the way that that is set up to kind of show a mirror to our culture of like, this is what happens when there's no regime change for a thousand years. This is what happens when one ideology is holding all the cards and no one else can have any influence in what's going on. Well, we can extrapolate the analogy further because the Lord Ruler is set up as being a quote unquote God Mm -hmm. um, that everyone must bow to their whims Mm -hmm. um, and there's no point in trying to challenge him because he's all powerful. And then those noble houses aren't just random groups of people. They are, as you say, dynasties of Mm -hmm. those people that the God decided were the right ones a thousand years ago. Right. And the interesting thing with that is the Lord Ruler is a man. Like he was a mortal guy a thousand years ago who seized a source of great power And the people who were his friends and who helped him are the people that he then set up to be the noble class. And the people who didn't were the people that he's decided are the Scots. Well, that's the mythology. I would question whether it can be said that his the nobles are descended from people that helped him, because the story that you have going up the mount, like from the logbook that you get of Mm -hmm. that event is from the guy who wasn't Rashek, who became the Mm -hmm. Lord Ruler. But wasn't Al one of before Alamance existed, but wasn't a terrorisman. Mm-hmm. And Roshek kills him and takes his place. Mm-hmm. Now the people around in that situation are going to be terrorismen mm-hmm. that Roshek doesn't want alive because mm-hmm. he wants them to not be around to give away his secret. And people who were there in the support of the guy that he just killed. So who his friends are that mm-hmm. he's made into these noble houses. I, I think a thousand years has allowed a lot of truths to arrive, mm-hmm. to disappear and new ones appear in their place. Again, something we may learn about more in later books or Yeah, regardless of whether the ancestors of the noble houses were actually Rishek's friends, he did select people to set up as the like upper class. Sure. To to whom he granted these abilities. And I, because that's why they're separate classes is to try and concentrate those powers of Alamancy in this upper strata. Right. I mean, we, we're set, sitting here spending our time mm-hmm. drawing comparisons to the founding fathers. We can go yeah, a little that's bit. That's the vote is what that is. Like it's yeah. giving only the upper class, the Alamancy is the equivalent of only allowing white landowning men to vote. And I mean, even something like the, oh yeah, we'll have a house war every so often that will keep things fresh and interesting for people is mm-hmm. calls to mind the Jefferson quote mm-hmm. about, yeah, we should have a violent revolution every 20 years or so. Just so people remember how to be independent and how to stand up to tyranny. Yeah. yeah. Not that the Lord Rule wants them people, to stand to his tyranny, no. just other people's tyranny. You know what? Tyrants are bad. Tyrants are not me. Yeah, but I mean, that's... Then you have, like, the practice of killing all of the Ska women that nobles rape as a an extreme form of voter suppression. I mean, the people who are able to exercise power in the society are the people who are Alamancers. I'm not sure that I would equate that to voter suppression within the I mean, story. I it's equal, I, but I think it's there's something there. I mean, I think that that is much more a form of lynching. Mm, um, a yeah. reminder of what place you're in. Like, you, you can think that you're whatever, but we might still come and take your daughter. And then that, what are you going to do about it? Well, um, no, the, the killing of Scott women that are raped is definitely, it's to keep the power of alamancy that's respected and right, gives but, you leverage in the world out of the hands of the underclass. Right, but doing things like that to keep a group of people terrorized is an um, additional not, effect of that. It's an additional effect, definitely, yeah. One of the other important aspects of how this regime stays in power, the Lord Ruler stays in power and keeps his stratified society going for as long as he does, which a thousand years is a really, really long time to have like one form of government and one form of a class system consistently. If you look at the history of the world, things tend to shake up a lot more quickly than that in human civilizations. And a big part of why this doesn't isn't even the alamancy of the nobles so much as it is the way that they're deployed in a targeted fashion, the soothing stations, to keep the ska from literally feeling the anger and, well, really like the anger of their situation and to feel out the outrage and to have the emotional response to their situation necessary to go out in the streets, to walk away from their jobs, to refuse to work. Um, and to stand up to the oppression that they're facing 
every day. There's a, a lot of other factors too. There's the general oppression that we see in our world too, of like not paying people enough, restricting access to things like food and shelter to a point where you have to work so hard for so long to meet your basic needs that you don't have time or energy for anything else. That's definitely a tactic that we see employed in the United States um, to keep people from having the leisure time and the energy to engage in activism, which is a big part of why we're seeing so much activism right now during the COVID pandemic. It has definitely been a wake up call to that idea that if even if you can assume that you get to only work one job and that's a full time job in a week, then 40 hours a week isn't eight hours of work a day. It's eight hours clocked in a day, losing an hour or so in the middle for your lunch break that you can be bothered by your coworkers on and you're losing an hour at each end for your commute. And by the time that you're actually getting home, you're exhausted and passing out. And I think that has, I've been seeing a lot of things very recently about highlighting that and how, as you say, it's enabling this activism during the COVID pandemic. And it's interesting that there seem to be allusions to that structure in this book that was published back in 2006. Exactly. We don't need soothing stations to prevent people from being able to engage in activism. But we have our own versions of them. They're distractions from everything else that's going on. I mean, you know, I, it might be a cynical view, but there's an aspect to which it's interesting that they're called soothing stations, that they're not called soothing posts, that they're not called emotion suppression posts or something. They're meant to soothe and calm. It's the bread and circuses. Mm-hmm. Um, That's a good point. So, I mean, it's the distraction. Hey, go watch Netflix. Don't mm-hmm. worry about Black Lives. Mm-hmm. That's an excellent point. We we don't need them. We have the internet. <laughs> the soothing stations, though, like, I do think that it's an amazing storytelling device to help explain why these people haven't been able to rally the way that you would expect to happen periodically, the way we've seen that happen periodically in our own history. I mean, the slave rebellions that happened in different parts of the world, in the United States and in the Caribbean in the 1700s and things like that, like those are an important part of human nature of just recognizing your inherent dignity as a person and the indignity of your situation and deciding that the risks are worth it to stand up. And the fact that you don't have anything that happens en masse in this world for a thousand years, like there needed to be something to explain it. And I, and I appreciate the simplicity of that is like, it's sapping that motivation because it's keeping you from getting roused enough to be angry about the indignity and the injustice of the situation that all the scar are in. Yeah. I think it's an important acknowledgement that just being if they were if it was just that they were being kept busy with their work that wouldn't be enough to keep the scar from rebelling successfully Mm -hmm. there has to be an extra element there and an element of people not being able to buy in because it feels like a war that they've already lost Mm -hmm. um it's why and you you know call for some form of change and people go well what you think something's going to happen you're not going to be able to do anything you're just one person like we're seeing lots of that right now and that's nice um, and I do want to say, like, we we throw stones at the internet and we throw stones at TV and things. I mean, there are aspects to which a lot of that stuff is helping activism as much as anything, whether that's through shows with representation that highlight problems to people that might not have otherwise come into contact with them, or whether it's people's organization through social media platforms and such. That they, That is a good thing, but it is also a distraction in a lot of ways. And it does depend on how people use it. And a lot of there are a lot of people, especially people who aren't touched by situations directly, that want a distraction. They want a way to not think about these things that they know aren't right in the world. And that is the thing that the internet is very capable of doing. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing that I, I, I'm guilty of having been scrolling through my newsfeed and going, wow, I'm stressed by the world. I wish there was a button that I could just press to give me 15 minutes of not the bad stuff. But that's such a privileged position to be in to even be able to think, what if I just didn't think about that for a while? If it wasn't in my newsfeed, I wouldn't have to think about it. Anyway, on that cheerful topic. So I want to talk about how the magic system is used within the story, particularly Allomancy. Um, And it leads on quite well from that discussion about class, um, because as a starting point of how that narrative is built, is that not all nobles and not all Scar can perform Allomancy. It's a restrictive trait. And it becomes sort of an additional class strata within those groups. 
And we see that in nobles, oh, if you've got an Alamancer, that's special. It makes more sense to one of the nobles why Renaud brought his niece with him to the city when she discovers that Vin is a mistborn. Renaud being the person posing as Vin's sponsor and uncle in, like, when sending her to balls and stuff. Like, she's posing as Lord Renaud's niece from the country. Yeah. But equally, if you are a Scar who is an Alamancer, then you're shunned in some ways because you're not supposed to exist. But within the groups that you end up in, you're considered more useful. You get figures like Spook, who is a Ten Eye and is treated to still not fantastically, but better than a lot of other Scar might be within those groups, which I think is really interesting to look at from the perspective of how Kelsey's group fits into the narrative of the whole world, in that Vin attacks them at one point for acting like nobles. Mm-hmm. Um, they seem to almost see themselves above the scar. They try their best not to, but they do. They do have that extra power that sort of puts them in this middle ground. Yeah, and it's interesting because, again, I'm reminded of Freyr where, like, there's a trap that people can fall into when they're trying to, like, quote-unquote, liberate an oppressed group where it can be this sort of false generosity of trying to help you rather than helping you help yourself or like supporting you in the way that you need to be supported, but letting the oppressed people run the show. And it's a trap that a lot of people in privileged positions fall into a lot where they see the plight of the oppressed and they want to help. And maybe their heart's in the right place, or maybe they just want to feel like they're good people for helping. But it, they, there's a trap you can fall into of being completely out of touch and also not respecting the c- capability and leadership role that the that a person and a group should have in their own liberation, if that makes sense. I'm not quite sure I'm putting it that well, but one of the things that we covered pretty early in my MSW program was, I forget the name of the exact society, but it's like one of the earlier kind of divisions and orientations towards social work. There was this group of like upper class women who wanted to help out, you know, the poor in their community, like the, and so they brought potted plants to give out to like the street kids. And then were super offended when they sold them. It's like, they wanted them to like have nice living conditions and like have something nice in their homes and things like that. And it's like, but these kids needed to eat, you know, and they're imposing what they think is a good thing on another group of people without ever talking to them or consulting them about it in any way. It's Hermione with the hats and the house elves. She's trying to liberate them for, she's trying to do it for them rather than actually talking to the oppressed group and finding out how she can best support what they need. Which is an interesting point with how then that group within the story, uh, they're using the scar, so they go, okay, We need to overthrow the final empire. How do we do that? Well, we're going to need a huge army of Scar. So we need to go and recruit those people. That's one of the things that they need. But they don't go out and just find anyone simply. They are using Breeze's alimantic abilities of... You're missing a very important piece of that. They're hired as a thieving crew by the current head of the Scar Rebellion. There's always a Scar Rebellion going on. It's just always very small and not very successful because the soothing stations and the conditions the Scar are working under all the time make it very difficult to gather enough support to really make a good showing of it. The head of the Scar Rebellion, Yedin, um, approaches Kelsier, or maybe they talk together. It's kind of unclear because Kelsier also really wants the Scar Rebellion to happen, but it's their plan, or they want Kelsier's crew to help him drum up enough support and handle a lot of the major oppositions that have put down Scar Rebellions in the past. So he isn't just manipulating the Scar to do this. It's the Scar Rebellion, the people who have managed to become radicalized, even despite all the things in place to keep that from happening, those are the ones who are saying, help us figure out how we can get this to actually have some traction. Sure. I think that you do get into some muddy area about free will with the rioting of emotions, etc. Oh, definitely. That's um, a super murky area in terms of consent. And, uh, yeah. And I mean, they do demonstrate that very early on with the way that those powers are introduced of Vin realizing that her emotions are under control and being uncomfortable with it. Or being manipulated at least, if not 
Sure. Controlled. Well, manipulation is a degree of control. I suppose. But I just think that's an important element of that. Sure. It's not like Kelsier woke up one day after he was tortured in the pits of Hath Sin. It was like, I'm going to bring this whole society down the Lord Ruler's head for me, and I'm going to use the Ska to do it. Yeah, okay. So you, you point out it is a gray area, but I think it is still gray because you have to question what authority does Yedin have to decide what other Ska are going to do. Sure. I don't get me wrong. I think the scar rising up is probably the best thing, but it's how you get there is a question. But at the same time, there he's trying to counter a whole lot of other institutionalized manipulation yes. going on at the hands of the Lord Ruler and his administration with the soothing stations and the backbreaking conditions and all of the social rules limiting the ska from being able to mobilize. So it, it is a sort you get into this sort of do two wrongs, make a right situation. Yeah. But I think it's a big part of drawing Kelsia as this sort of gray character because it's very much set up so that you don't know what Kelsia's end goal is. He's got this weird mythology around himself. He's got this 11th metal that he's making sure people know about that he doesn't really know what he's doing with it. And you have this parallel story in the logbook of this person who knows that they're going to be offered great power and needs to refuse it because otherwise they might become a huge tyrant. And it's set up so that you think Kelsia might gain power and become the next, the villain of the next book. That was a possibility that crossed my mind at one point. Mm -hmm. Because he does cross those lines in places where, well, who are you doing this for? What's your motivation and what are your methods? And how much of that is okay? And that's why we do keep getting the thieving crew coming to him and being like, hey, you need to maybe not do that thing. Like, we're not really comfortable with this. The fact that his response to that is, if you don't like it, you can leave. Yeah, the not, thing, not great. To, be, to clarify is he's setting himself up as some sort of messiah with the ska. He's very much making them think he's maybe more powerful than he is. Definitely giving them some ideas of him as like a larger than life, more than human type of figure. And yeah, the rest of the thieving crew are super justifiably uncomfortable with that. <laughs> Um, we'll look back to that a bit in our conversation about religion in a yeah. minute. A couple of other things I wanted to touch on with this, and I mean, most of these are fairly simple, I think. Um, I think Atium is, uh, we, we've had an argument over whether it's pronounced Atium or Atium. It's clearly Atium because otherwise it's the grand source of money called ATM, and I'm not okay with that. It's my understanding that Brandon, Brandon Sanderson doesn't care how people pronounce it, so. So we'll use the one that isn't dumb. I mean, I'm just probably going to say it the way that I kept thinking of it, which is Atium, even though I think that it is supposed to be Atium. Okay. I think that linguistically, for other reasons that I'm not going to get into, it should be Atium for spoiler reasons. Okay. Point being, I think it's a parallel to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels and plastics, like petroleum-based industry in our society. It's non-renewable. It can be used up. It's incredibly dangerous and expensive to extract. And it seems to be the center of power grabs and fighting in the upper classes and only shitty consequences trickle down to everybody else. Yes, 100% agree. I think it's notable that slavery is used to mine it mm -hmm. and that it's something that grows back but takes time. Like, wasn't it like thousands of years or something? It's, it's maybe, unclear. Maybe million. It definitely is a thing that, like, it's... It's something that condenses out of water in that specific place or something, right? Well, there's but the like... little crystal structures that generate geodes that have it at the heart. But yeah. when Kelsia destroys those, it's effectively a, this will take so long to re regrow that it's effectively gone. Like, right. We're, they're going to have to totally reorganize the economy around something else because it's no longer going to be there to be harvested as the backbone of the economy. Yeah. I think it is interesting that the Atium store is just disappeared at the end and we don't know where that is. That's obviously a setup for the next book. But yeah, that's going to be an interesting one. So I do want to talk a bit about how the ma magic system works as far as having the individual metals versus Miss Bond who can do all of them. Mm -hmm. First off, just what do you think it means that you can either do one of them or all of them. Why no middle ground, do you think, from a storytelling perspective or from an in-world perspective? I'm not sure about the in-world perspective. Mechanically, I could see like arguments for people having pairs, like the matched ones, because no. there's such a dual structure built in. There's a, a metal and its alloy, and they have opposite properties or at least related properties. You know, there's the... 
I forget which metals do what things, but like there's the one that dampens your emotions and there's the one that like ramps them up and they're all kind of paired that way until you see they're not, which just begs the question of like, well, where's the pair that obviously must go with this? We don't get a pair for gold, for we'll, example. We'll get into that. But like, I could see an argument of like, you know, you're constitutionally capable of interacting with one, except some of the alloys are actually an alloy of two base metals, mm. even though it's not paired within that system, just in terms of the way metalworking is. Because, for example, like in reality, brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. In this system, it's the opposite of copper, has no relationship to zinc. Zinc has its own pair. So I can see why Brandon Sanderson might have kept it to only one, just to avoid like chains like that, that would kind of break down logically. Whereas yeah. then, and then with the Mistborn, you don't have to worry about those kinds of dynamics. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, there's an extent to which like how useful some of the individual metals are without the other one is uh, like the distinction between the power that someone who is a steel pusher has and if they can just use iron to pull versus both is ridiculous because with one or the other, like you can go, aha, now that thing's over there. Cool. If you can do both and you're immiscible and you can fly. True. I mean, there's also some that are useless all on their own. There's that metal that the guards give in that just wipes out all her metals. I'm like, if that's the only thing you can use, I mean, what does that even do? <laughs> like, right. like you, you can literally do nothing. Like, how many people can do that but don't know? Because right. why would you know? Yeah, you'd have um, no way of knowing that. And it's interesting how brass and zinc would work together. Because it's degrees of the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you can riot someone's emotions, there's nothing to say that you can't riot someone's anger, but also riot their feeling of calm. Mm -hmm. So really what you have is you can either turn all those dials up to 11, or you can turn them all to mute and which ones you're doing. And they do demonstrate that you can get very similar effects in some situations with yeah soothing or rioting by kind of playing with the dials like in much the way you're talking about, but not, you can't get all the same effects. Like you can't make someone really mad with soothing. That's in fact, the whole point of soothing is that a person can't get really anything. If they are already really mad and you turn down everything else, then you might keep them from moderating that anger in some other way. Yeah. But you couldn't generate it. Yeah. Do you have a theory on why it's, one or everything, never some other combination. I think it helps from a storytelling perspective to keep the Mistborn as more powerful. If you had someone who could steal push an iron pole, who that was their ability, then the distance between that and a Mistborn is less so. I think that a big part of why it might look that way is just because Kelsier is our first and boldest example of a Mistborn. And that's his specialty, is the manipulation of those two particularly together. I think if we had a different Mistborn teaching Vin, or later on just seeing Vin before her interactions with Kelsier were separate from that, you don't necessarily see, I don't think that's necessarily the takeaway. I think that his powers with the writing and soothing of emotions in the scene with the army where he's got the banquet going on, mm -hmm. I think shows that there's a lot of power there as well. Oh, sure. And yeah. especially then combining it with the other things. I think it also makes it easier just if you're writing a story to be able to say, this person can do this one thing, this person can do this one thing, and this person can like so. Sure, but you're saying that if somebody could still push an iron pole and not do anything else... It, they would be almost as powerful as a Mistborn. And that's what I'm challenging. I think that no, it no, I'm feels saying that, that way because Kelsier is the main example you get early in the book when you're kind of getting a sense for the power of these abilities. I'm not saying that it would seem like they were close to them. I'd say it would be closer to them. I mean, anything it, two is closer to eight or whatever, like than one is, of course. Right. So my point is that by keeping it to one, they managed to make the Mistborn seem that much more special. The fact that um, Shanna Lariel is a Mistborn is amazing. She's so powerful because she's a Mistborn compared to the other people that can be pushed off a roof and, oh, well, they're gone now. What do you think Alamancy does as a storytelling element in the story? Like, what do you think its function is? Well, I think there's a few things it does. Um, and I think one of them is hilarious because it's... I think it does two things at the same time that should be contradictory, which is that I think it's a leveler. I think it manages to build those class distinctions that I talked about at the same time, but it also means that some of those class distinctions don't exist. I agree. I think it does do several things in the story. I think one of the most important things is that it is a clear signifier that this stratification is artificial between the nobles and the ska. 
yeah. and that it is entirely something that's socially engineered, but not actually present in the physical persons of those groups of people. I think that it makes for some really cool combat, which is a fun storytelling technique. True. I think the other two th main things it does is it gives windows into certain areas that you wouldn't get to see otherwise, because Vink can access areas that she shouldn't be able to if she didn't have special abilities. And also it creates a lot of mystery regarding what the actual powers of Alamancy are, what are the what's a potential 11th metal, what are some mm -hmm. of the pairs for things that sort of come up towards the end of the book that are unanswered, and how does that then interplay with Farukami, etc. Mm -hmm. I think it definitely does that, and I agree that one of the things that it accomplishes in terms of having this be the first book in a trilogy is setting up those unanswered questions and kind of teasing the reader to look at that table and think about some of the other stuff that happens ago. There's some stuff missing here. We don't have the full picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the sort of driving force behind a lot of the mystery that is within the story. I mean, you get some aspects of like mysteries and stuff that are this weird mystery thing off over there. But so much of it is about who is the Lord Ruler? What are these powers that he has? And to a degree, what is Vin's relationship to those powers? Which you can get back into in a moment. Yeah. But I also think another important thing, going back to what you said before about Vin having access to places and information she wouldn't otherwise have as a result of her powers. I think it also opens a door to her gaining insight into a lot of different lived experiences in the world that she wouldn't otherwise know because it gives her, her an in-universe, in-story reason to have these little internships with the different specialists in their crew to learn the more, like to learn the finer points and the, the more advanced techniques. While she's learning those techniques, she's also getting to kind of spend a day in the shoes of and learning from the experience of people who've had a very different life and a very different viewpoint on this world, which is very helpful as a storytelling device to us, as we talked about before. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Vin has to sort of ask for some of those. Like, it's not a natural thing for Kelsey to be like, oh, yeah, you should spend some time with each of these people. But I think that it is that whole she's moving between worlds thing. I mean, the Vin Valette mm -hmm. and her like very notably questioning like well which of these people am i am i either of them it's the moving between scar and nobility but also then her ability to get the perspectives of Cezed as a terraceman and hearing about his keeper abilities and the stories and perspectives he's able to provide and then to go as i said earlier with the hearing the different stories of the different people in the crew and then the way that the alamancy for those people feeds into their existence i mean ham very much defines himself through his representation as a pewter arm and seems to sort of have this thug persona on the outside that he carries where he wants to rip the sleeves off of all of his garments but is also tiresome to breeze because he always wants to ask these existential philosophical questions that breeze doesn't have the patience for despite the fact that he's the one that's dealing with the emotions yeah i do like that juxtaposition of the the two of them there i also want to point out another function alamancy has in the story is to show further stratifications within categories and like haves and have nots and how different experiences of access affect people differently. Because Vin has been a Mistborn for a very long time. We know that people snap at some point in time. And she seems to have snapped like when she was very, very young. And so she's been using these abilities her whole life without knowing with like minuscule like trace elements from the drinking water and like using pewter utensils and things like that. And we see that she ends up having a much greater aptitude and finer control of a lot of what she can do than Kelsier, who is coming at his misborn abilities, which he snapped into through a traumatic experience from a position of privilege though, because at the point that he developed the ability, he had a teacher and he had the ability to secure a supply of the materials that he needed to expend his abilities at much higher powerful rates. And he kind of takes it for granted. Whereas Vin has literally been meeting it out in like tiny judicious portions her entire life as a means of survival and only as a means of survival. That's interesting because one of the things that I have as a question is beyond protagonist power, chosen one status, why is Vin's 
Alamancy is so powerful, why is it that she can see someone do something and then do it? Whether that be a fight with the Lord Ruler where she goes, oh, he can push the trace elements in my body when you're not supposed to be able to push things in a body. That means that I can pull his bracelets out of his arms. And then he, she does it, despite the fact that nobody else thinks that that's something that can be done. Um, the fact that she can sense through copper clouds and things like that. I mean, from a storytelling element, it's, there's a protagonist aspect to it where we sort of expect the main character to be more powerful in a weird way. But you think it's just because she snapped so young and with so much need? I think it's because she has been doing it with less for so much longer. Mm -hmm. than Kelsier, who's our only other example. And so I think she's been doing it instinctively, not having internalized any ideas of what should and shouldn't be possible. Mm, interesting. I think it gave her a much greater aptitude for a lot of particularly nuanced and delicate work and use of her abilities, as well as not having preconceived ideas of what she can and can't do. I think I already said, but whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I hadn't really looked at it that way. Um, I had just sort of assumed that she had some special trait that would be explored in a later book. I mean, and uh, that's very possible too, and that might explain some of it, but I don't think it explains all of it. Yeah. There's certain things where people haven't tried because they just thought they couldn't. Although there is the point where Vin tries to burn ferrochemical metal from Suzette, mm -hmm. and he lets her try it, but does say afterwards, like, yeah, I mean, people have tried before. Like, it's interesting that you could sense it in this way, but we knew it didn't really work because people have tried it. It doesn't Did work. he say people tried it before? I thought he said that that's similar to what happens if an if a fair if a uh, fair chemist tries to use someone else's metals. There's some comment about like this has been tried before at some point because it's thousand. I think he might say, oh, of course it doesn't work because if it did work, we'd know it's been a thousand years. Someone else must have tried this. Sure. Another thing I just remembered I wanted to mention, but it kind of relates back to the culture of the nobles and Alamancy is the the snapping and how it seems to happen often under like a traumatic experience. Sometimes that's birth, sometimes that's a beating. And that has resulted in the culture of the nobles embracing cruelty as a necessary part of their society's strength. So they beat their kids to the point of death to make sure they haven't missed an opportunity for an alamancer or a misborn in their family. I don't know that that comes up in this it book. It does. It does come up in that book. Interesting. I know there's a talk of Elland isn't an Alamancer because he got attacked at one point and mm -hmm. didn't show any Alamantic abilities. But I don't remember anything about the... I'm pretty sure it's mentioned in the book. Okay. If it's not, I apologize for the spoiler. But it's an important aspect of the nobles' culture and like their ability to be desensitized to cruelty as a way of life and mm -hmm. their oppression of the ska. Like they are even cruel to each other. They they just accept that as something that you have to get over and deal with if you want to have any sort of, you know, a nice life. Which I guess sort of explains away their nonchalance of the Oh, someone was murdered. Okay. Yeah, they have to become desensitized to violence. Yeah. Like they've all been beaten or had some sort of horrible near-death experience at some point. There, It's a society of traumatized people. Not that that makes their oppression and enslavement and rape and murder of the ska like okay. I'm just saying this is part of a bigger picture of them as people who have so many assumptions to do with torment and trauma that are so deeply dysfunctional and messed up. Just going off of that for a moment, like I think I forget who it is. It's probably Ellen who says that like the nobles aren't free. They're just slaves under the Lord Ruler in a different way, which is the sort of comment that could only come from someone who had never been on a scar plantation. He kind of has a point, but trying to equate what they go through with what the scar go through is... Yeah, no, I agree. But I do, I think it raises an important point where being complicit in a system like that also hurts you. It right. detracts from your humanity. Again, Paolo Freer gets into this quite a bit in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Everyone should read this book. It's great. But yeah, there you go. that's that, your homework for that next if episode. You, if you are oppressing somebody and contributing to the oppression of other people, you are also eroding your own humanity and your own capacity for compassion because you are selectively turning it off. So the last thing I want to talk about with the magical system, I don't necessarily want to get into a huge amount of detail with on this episode because I suspect that there's going to be much more to talk about with the next episode, uh, which is talking about Farukami. Mm -hmm. It's used as a plot device in a couple of ways in this book. Mm -hmm. It's provided as a way of knowledge 
being a thing that is not quantifiable as such, but corporeal. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Well, they're like a way of there being like memory cards in a pre-industrial, so- well, is it pre-industrial? In a pre-industrial society. Yeah. And it makes it so that there's a physical manifestation of the Lord Ruler's attempt to eradicate that knowledge. His hunting of the Keepers is, within the story, part of his trying to protect himself. But within a, our own culture, it's the attempt to control knowledge mm-hmm. and who can have knowledge. Yeah, it's um, censorship. Yeah, it is a it's, ongoing form of censorship. Yeah, it also works as the aha moment with how the Lord Ruler stays alive for so long, etc. It doesn't go into a huge amount of depth on a lot of it. We get only two characters that use it, and one of those is the Lord Ruler, who we don't exactly get huge conversations with about his use of it. So I'm sort of interested to see how that progresses in the next book, and how that ties in with the Inquisitor's um, Spike's magic stuff. Mm -hmm. Which is its own mystery set up in this book because you find out so little about how that all works, but it clearly is some other form of metal-based magic like Furukami and like Allomancy. Um, But because the Inquisitors are like this secret order and we only see Marsh after he's been part of it very briefly at the end, so it's not like he can... He gives a quick explanation. Yeah, so it's not like he can really say a whole lot about it. So it's definitely one of those like, next time on the... In the yeah. Mistborn trilogy, you'll find out probably more about this also this additional magical system. And I'm interested to see how things that were used to drive the plot in this book become a part of the world in the next book. Because I'm assuming we're going to meet more keepers and terracemen and uses of Fer- Ferukami, and that we might see Vin try and do something with Ferukami a bit. And probably see more about these other like creatures the Lord Ruler made, like the Coloss, whatever the hell those are. Oh yeah, that's the, a vague reference. They're okay. like they're like the Lord Ruler's like boogeyman giant soldier mm-hmm. people. And we don't really know much about them other than that they're terrifying and huge. I think that that's, yes. that's what it, we know about them and like that's it. Yeah. And it's like we just want to keep them from being able to come to the city to stop the rebellion. Um yeah. so there are definitely lots of seeds planted in this book that are probably going to become more relevant down the line. Which we'll talk about a bit more in our like last section, which is yeah. what happens next. Did you have anything you wanted to add about Furukami? I think it's a very interesting and elegant system in that, you know, it's that conservation of mass idea where nothing can be changed or nothing can be destroyed, only changed. You can't net become stronger, younger, or anything like Nothing comes with a price. You can borrow from yourself. You're always borrowing from Peter to pay Paul in whatever you're doing, which is a very fascinating system. And it's 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 very balanced, and I and it appeals to me in that way. Yeah, it's interesting how even the Lord Ruler's burning it, while exponentially more powerful, is an element of multiplication rather than it still has. He still has to give to get it. Yeah, it's. He's sort of min-maxed, and that's what's going on there. But it's it's weird. Like, the Lord Ruler broke the rules. Like, that's clearly what's happening. Like, he found a cheat code in whatever pool of power he sucked up. But everyone else has to find some sort of balance. If you're an Alamancer, you're destroying some part of the world to get this effect in the world. And so you've taken something away. You've burned this metal, and you've, you know, like burning gasoline. It's not there anymore. The energy has been expended. But with the Ferricumists, that's a closed system. You're not bringing that you're using the metal as a like a medium, as like a conduit. But the actual attribute, the energy in whatever form it is, is circulating in the same system. It's a, it's a neat idea and a neat process. Yeah. So I think the last major topic that we wanted to talk about here was religion, which obviously we've sort of touched on a little bit here and there before. Mm -hmm. So Kelsier has this secret plan to build a religion around himself where he's getting this sort of set of myths set up around who he is and the powers that he has by making sure he is appearing to people in various ways. And then martyring himself. Right. And in addition to martyring himself, setting it up so that the Chandra, which is sort of like a body snatcher set up in the story, can appear to people as Kelsier after he's died and as a miracle to really solidify this idea of him as more than human in the eyes of the Ska. Yeah. Um, So we see him create this plan without being told directly what is going on. 
it's one of those things that when you look back, you're like, oh, that's why he was having conversations with us about religion all the time and trying to understand them and sometimes asking to hear about the same ones multiple times. Which I think is just a very well done bit of storytelling where you do get the, when you look back, you can see it. Mm -hmm. But I think you would struggle to read the book and be like, oh, he's, he's going to make himself a god. It's It does become clear, I think, before it happens. Sure. Like, it's not like at the end you're like, oh, I didn't see it coming. Like, you do see it coming, but you don't see it coming for a while. Like, a lot of groundwork has been has to be laid first. I do love those exchanges with Sazed because not only do they retrospectively act as like foreshadowing of what Kelsier is trying to do and kind of telling you how he did it, but it also is a wider world building of the history of the Lord Ruler's consolidation of power and the diversity in the world that existed before this unchanging regime of a thousand years, um, which you can see a lot of that diversity has been stamped out. That's why there aren't any other religions anymore. It's just the worship of the Lord ruler. So again, like Alamancy, it performs several different functions as all good storytelling elements do. Yeah. And I think that it says something really nice about religion as well through Sazed's conversations about it, because he's acknowledging the validity of all of these religions. Like he doesn't say that some are true and some are false or that he follows just this one because it's clearly the true one. And then when people, when he's talking to people, he tries to find them religions that might help them in their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. He sees it as a way of thinking that helps you to get through things. It's one of the problems I have with Richard Dawkins is him saying, oh, there's no such God thing as God and people should just forget about it and get rid of the idea. Is that, well, no. There's a reason that every civilization on Earth seems to have a belief in a higher power. It's because it helps from a social standing point. Regardless of what your beliefs, having those beliefs helps you get through the day some days. It, you might be in a position where your belief is that there is a scientific rationale to the world, and that's that's good too. That's your belief. I mean, I do believe that there's a scientific rationale to the world. I'm not saying that there isn't. I'm not some flat Earth crazy person or something. Yeah, I really appreciate that approach from Sazed. And I remember finding that in those conversations, like very appealing because I must've read this in college, maybe later, but for a long time, I've had a similar perspective on religion that like, there isn't one right way of believing in a higher power or believing in something larger than yourself. And that having a very dogmatic perspective of religion that says that only one path is valid is incredibly limiting and also very unfair to the vast majority of people who've ever lived or believed in anything. And so I, I appreciate that validation of this idea that like, yeah, there's a function to religion in a human life and in a human mind. And there isn't necessarily a need to decide on like a true path. No. Yeah, which I think comes down to um, one of the conversations that you get at the end which is the sort of this question of whether it matters that Kelsio was a man. And you get a conversation with, I think it's Vin and Sazed, where um, like this religion is sprouting up around them and Vin says, but well, he was a man. And Sazed says, a lot of them were. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't necessarily about someone having a special power. It's about the passion that they drive. Right. And it begs the question, which is another topic I love talking about, but of if you understand how something works, does that make it work any less? Does it make it any less amazing or powerful that it exists and is the thing that it is. Like if I understand like that the air I breathe releases the energy in my food to power the cells of my body, is that any less amazing for my ability to understand that that's how the process works? Is photosynthesis any less amazing because I can diagram it after taking like high school biology class? I don't think so. I think that it is still miraculous and amazing and sublime. And when you, if you think about just how complex and the outcomes and the, just the secondary and tertiary and ongoing effects of everything, even if you know how it works, it get, just because you understand it doesn't make it not awesome. Right. And I think that you can draw a strong line with things that people do disregard as more superstitious or magical um where i mean whether it's that you wear a special item that remind that you feel has a power because it reminds you of the thing that you want to do or whether it's a meditation that you know means that you're centering your thoughts on a certain thing the fact that maybe it's just in psychology you're 
making yourself think about something so you do it i often write things down because i need to remember them and it's not that i now have a piece of paper that has it written on that will remind me it's the fact that i took the moment to write it down i can throw the piece of paper once away once i've written it down it's an act that makes me think of something i think there's a lot of things that people disregard as being just superstition and such that works on psychological levels at the bare minimum but can be very useful to people Sure. I mean, we'll look at the placebo effect. I mean, at this point in like drug trials, the I believe the bar for something being considered enough more effective than placebo to be like measurably effective is like 5%. There are drugs on the market that were approved because they're 5% better than placebo. And sometimes the side effects are pretty freaking bad. Like, but that's how we can tell that something is doing more than our brain's engagement of our body is able to do, which tells you that our brains being able to engage the powers of our body is pretty amazing. Like the level of change possible from that level is not inconsiderable. It's something to be impressed by. And just because you know something's placebo effect, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. And that's been tested. Even if you know that something's a placebo, it works. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if we could access the other 90% of our brain. Oh my God, I will kill you right now. <laughs> Why would you even say that? <laughs> we do use 100% of our brain. There are redundancies built in, which is part of where yeah. that bullshit comes from. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. We don't need to delete that in. That was purely for me. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. But my point is that whether you understand how something works or not, the fact that you can attribute some sort of stimulus to an outcome doesn't make that outcome any less real or powerful or important. Kelsier being a man who had specific abilities and made some plans to make things look even more cool after he died doesn't change the fact that he inspired a community that had failed to successfully rise up for a thousand years. Right. That on its own, like, is enough to inspire a community of people to keep his memory alive and hold the principles he taught them dear for generations after. Yeah. And I mean, even something like having the Khandra take on his face and appear to members of the community to show that Kelsia can't be killed, Kelsia's hope can't be killed. Mm -hmm. It's a mechanism. Mm -hmm. But is it wrong? I mean, it is manipulative. Let's, it is I mean, manipulative. It's definitely it is manipulative. But I don't think it makes the religion that springs up around those ideals any less valid. Yeah. His point sort of still stands. At that yeah. Position. And those people still had that experience of thinking he was gone and being reminded that the most important thing he contributed to them, hope, wasn't gone. That that was something that they had the power to keep. I kind of want to check how long the period of time in the book is from when Kelsia snaps to his death, because I would put money on it being three years. Hmm. Because I think there's a lot of Jesus parables oh, out definitely. there. Oh, definitely. And I'm pretty sure that Kelsia, if I were to go and look at the timeline, would have been about 30 when he snapped and about 33 when he died. And the appearing to his disciples mm -hmm. after his death, like, oh, yeah, there's definitely some very intentional homage there to uh, parallels between Kelsier and Jesus. And there's a whole thing of like part of his power is he died, but he made the Lord Ruler do it, forcing the Lord Ruler to acknowledge his power, as it were. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus was a revolutionary figure. So in a lot of ways, his most radical ideas, I think, have been sanitized in a lot of ways, but he was a revolutionary. And yeah. I I think that that is an important aspect that's being referenced in that character. Like, Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's honestly miraculous that the thieving crew isn't 12 people. <laughs> um, okay. We just went through it just to make sure there are only 10 followers of Kelsia in the form of the crew. So there's not the straight 12 disciples. So we're okay. I was right. And that's, that's 10, including Yedin, which is arguable. He was more of the employer than one of Kelsier's crew. Point being, I, d I think that there are intentional parallels there. Yes. Clearly. So to go back to, to not talking about Jesus. The Lord Ruler has set out to destroy all the religions from the off with his career reign. Mm -hmm. That's what it's called. Which makes sense from the point of view of him trying to destroy the prophecies that might have suggested that it shouldn't be him, but then has continued to eradicate all religion and try and set himself up as this 
one true god type figure. Where was I going with this? Not sure. Me neither. I read that as him trying to, similarly to Kelsier, like use the power of religion to solidify his power. But he's trying to use religion to keep things the same, whereas Kelsier is using religion to try and change the world and, you know, foment rebellion and engineer a spirit of resistance that will persist after he's gone. It will be interesting to see what the followers of Kelsier's religion think of other religions in future books, I can see that being a problem. Potentially. And Suzed not being keen on that situation. But I think it's a nice parallel that you have Suzed there to be like, all religions are valid mm -hmm. to the Lord Rulers. Like, it's just me. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one. Like, okay. It, you can tell that the clear, correct religion is worshipping me because remember how I saved the world that one time and see how much more powerful than you all I am? Yeah, it's definitely definitely the right one. Yep. Empirical evidence, all point, which at this point obviates the, the need for faith. Like it's created this system where it's like he's trying to prove like his religious superiority through empirical evidence. Which I guess is where the scar come down on, oh, God is real and he hates us. Yeah. Like um, you can see how that might beat some people down. And speaking of the Lord Ruler, like using religion to sort of solidify his power base, I think that kind of leads in pretty well to another thing we wanted to talk about, which is that this is a story of what happens after you save the world, in a sense, because it's the Lord Ruler saved the world a thousand years ago, and in the, in so doing, also set himself up to be immortal and be able to stay in power perpetually, and pretty much until somebody else takes him out. And so you have that idea of like, you either die a hero or you live to see yourself become the villain. And that's what we're seeing. This is a world where he survived saving the world, kind of. He did save it, but he also really fucked it up. And now we see the fallout of what can happen if you think you're right and that you are the one with the best judgment and you're the one with the best credentials to be in charge. And then nothing can check you on that for ages and ages and ages. I think I kind of challenge that notion because it's Rorschach. If it was the writer of the logbook that was in power, then that would be him going, well, I don't know if I'm really the right person for this and that, which I think is what you need in that position is someone who doesn't believe that they are the best person for the job, who is arrogant about it. If he had got to the position that the Lord Ruler is in, then he would have saved the world and then fucked it up. Whereas Rashik, I think, saved the world by taking power for himself. And I think taking power for himself was a bigger goal there. He felt it was owed to him because he was a terrorist. Sure, but he did save the world from the thing that was destroying it. But it's I don't just, think in the way that is intended. No, no, you're right. I don't think it wasn't in the way that was intended. Well, we can argue about intention, though. I mean, intended, like the prophecies and stuff. We don't really know that much about it because they're very vague and peripheral in the actual book. But there was a great evil. Rorschach did keep that great evil from destroying the world. He also didn't really know what he was doing in that process and threw a whole lot of other stuff out of balance. But he also, in doing that, like, because he had the ego to put him in that position where he wanted to be the one to save the world, felt he was owed, that he deserved to be the one to be in that position. He also had the arrogance to think that like, okay, well now I've saved the world and the world owes me and I should be in charge. I clearly have the best judgment to do it because who was the one who saved the world? It was me. So yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, or it's, he was on the wrong foot from the beginning, but he did still save the world, kinda. I think that this is a conversation we're gonna have to come back to in our next episode on Mistborn. Probably. Because I suspect that we're going to find some more about that out. Sure. Before we get into full on predictions from me as to what might come up in the next book, um, there are a couple of characters that I think it's worth us just sort of taking a look at on their own for how they function within the story and how they tell the story there. So I think the first one is Spook. Mm -hmm. We sort of get very little information about him. He's characterized fairly simply. And I think just some of the stuff that happens with him is very strange. Well, he's Clubs' nephew, right? I think so. Yeah. He's come from another city, which has got a weird dialect, mm -hmm. which causes some hilarity and is clearly like intended to mimic things like Cockney rhyming slang. But beyond that, he doesn't get a huge amount of characterization other than he thinks Vin is cute. Yeah, he has a thing for her and she doesn't really think of him in that way. And they have a cute exchange about it. 
I don't think that's a cute exchange. I, I mean, think that's... it's a little bit sad, but like, I think it's a good conversation or like they talk about it. She doesn't lead him on in any way. Like he doesn't take it badly that she's not interested. And I think that's healthy. Like it's awkward, but I think it's good. And I think it's good to model that kind of two people being in different places on that without anyone having hard feelings. Not like Spook feels great about being rejected by Vin, but like, He's not mad at her or anything. Sure. I don't think I'd clarify it as cute. Okay. And also, like, the problem that I have with that scene is he was like, yeah, I knew it couldn't really happen. Like, it's not, oh, okay, that's how you feel. I understand. It's, well, you were obviously out of my league, Mm -hmm. which is an odd message with everything else going on. And especially when the interest that she has instead is Ellen. Mm -hmm. I know. It's weird, and that some of that might come down to her being a misborn, and he might see her as out of his league because of that. He's just the ten eye. Yeah. yeah. But I think that the other part of it that makes it weird to me is that his role in the book is to be this weird little comic relief with his weird speaking. Mm-hmm. He's a ten eye sentry, and he has a thing for Vin and gets rejected. Like I think I needed one more thing about him. I needed him to do something else to be important for another reason. That the weird romantic subplot part wouldn't feel like just a way of her learning about handkerchiefs, personally. I just don't want to get into spoiler territory. Okay. I do wonder whether something with that will crop up in later books. I think part of the thing with him, though, is he is really young and he's brought in as a sort of auxiliary person. Like, he's not a central part of the crew. Clubs brings him in because he's his nephew. He knows he can trust him and he has an ability that would be useful for the crew to have because they don't have a Tanai. Because child soldiers... I mean, there's also an element of that. I mean, it's part of how people get roped into ongoing resistance movements and things like that. I mean, we have rebel hearts on the shelf over there. People, you know, people are raised in resistance movements like the IRA and, you know, it becomes a way of life for some communities. So, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily a poor comparison, but... I think he's a little bit on the outskirts in the narrative because he is a bit of on the outskirts of the crew. Yeah, that's fair. I'm interested to see what happens with him in the future books, certainly. As far as people that I'm interested to see what happens with in the future books, um, I'm interested to see how, what plays out with the Inquisitors and Marsh. Mm. Because I think that Marsh is a really interesting character within this book to begin with. And him becoming an Inquisitor and removing all the other Inquisitors from the city yeah. plays some interesting aspects. He's sort of the... F- Character that is best at seeing through Kelsey's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Which right. makes sense because it's his brother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like a lot of experience with that. I like the fact that I think at the end there's he's talking and says like there's two things he can't forgive Kelsey for and the first is being the one to figure out how to get rid of the final empire and the second is dying in the process. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a sad and sweet moment. Yeah. I, I appreciate that he is set up as having been the champion of the rebellion before Kelsier had any interest in it. Like when Kelsier was being a pretty frivolous person prior to his current priorities in the book. And so he's sort of, he's the person who like became interested in the thing you were interested in and then like got way more into and successful with it than you did and kind of stole the rebellion from Marsh, like at the point that Marsh had kind of lost steam or like had decided he couldn't really do it anymore at that time. Like he had to step away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that he doesn't seem upset about being made an Inquisitor. Um, I mean, I don't know whether that's a process where when you're picked to be an Inquisitor, you become an Inquisitor or if you're asked or something. But that's a fairly big change to be made for the rebellion. I don't get the impression he was given much of a choice. Right. I feel like there should be an element at the end of him sort of mourning who he was to some degree. But we get so wrapped up in everything else that there's not really an opportunity for that. Yeah. Like the point at which, oh, well, now I have giant metal spikes for eyes. Like you're not going to have a particularly normal life in any regard at that point. Yeah. And we know that they had a bunch of other spikes in them too, because he says he has to pull one out of the other Inquisitors to like disable them or like they're held together by this process somehow as well. Like, it does seem to be a pretty traumatic process that changes how your body works at this point. Like clearly you can see, but with those weird spikes. So there, there are probably some changes involved with yeah. that. And I, I do think it is a shame that we don't get that reflection from Marsh on like what he's given to the rebellion or 
you know, what he maybe didn't know he signed up to give for the rebellion because it doesn't seem like he knew that that was a risk going in. Yeah. When he went undercover. And it's an interesting moment for the reader because it's Marsh being brought back from the dead. Mm -hmm. Like, we think, along with Kelsia, that Marsh was killed very gruesomely. Um, and, oh, he's not dead. Well, he's he might also not quite be Marsh anymore. Like, he seems yeah. very much mentally to still be Marsh. So I'm interested to see what happens with him in the next book, certainly. Yeah, and, and him still seeming to be Marsh does kind of beg the question because all the others are... Uh, all the other Inquisitors we meet seem so inhuman as to whether that takes a while to set in. Right. There's an extent to which they're alive for so much longer than humans. We don't know exactly what their lifespan is, but the implication seems to be that they are not aging at the same rate as normal humans would be. But the Inquisitors that we've seen before are going to have been picked by the Lord Ruler or the Lord Ruler's Inquisitors and then kept around the Lord Ruler who can control people's emotions in a very strong way yeah. and presumably removed from all previous connections. Mm -hmm. Like, no letter went out to Marsh's family to say, by the way, he is now an Inquisitor, but don't worry, he'll be home on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Like, as far as they're concerned, he's gone. Well, and they so, have like a barracks or whatever that they were all sleeping in. Well, they sleep in the top of the tower with the right. Lord Ruler. Which is a barracks. Like, it's a... Well, sure, but barracks is, of course, to mind a building outside well, a, somewhere. It's a room full of bunk beds like <laughs> i think they each have their own little wow. oyster room i know it's weird. point being like yeah. quartered somewhere together not having their own lives those, those are people who are now not human but are tools of the leader so mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how Marsh progresses when he presumably still has some sort of connection with some i mean he doesn't seem to have been massively close with anyone that we get like we don't get told about Marsh's you know, family and friends or anything. He's not close to the thieving crew. But I would assume that Vin would stay in contact with him in various ways, and he's going to be in it of, unfortunately, of use to Ellen. He's in charge of the ministry. Right. Because the control of the ministry got passed to the Inquisitors, and, well, he's the only Inquisitor now, so... Yeah. The fact that he killed all the rest and the Lord Ruler is gone <laughs> might pose some issues. Like, I think there's a point at which the bureaucracy of that breaks down. Anyway, I think it makes sense for us to move on to the few sort of predictions I have for the next book. Obviously, I think the fact that the Asium is gone is going to be a fairly large plot point. I think that whatever Roshek did with the deepness mm. didn't destroy it in the way that the prophecies were supposed to. I think that he has um, sort of done some stuff to safeguard against it, and his presence has been what's kept it in check. And the fact that he didn't do it properly is why plants don't grow green anymore and volcanoes are erupting all the time. Like, I think he stopped it destroying the world, but I don't think he just, that he stopped it. So I think the extent to which he's a savior is under question there. Um, and I suspect that the next book as I'm aware, is called Well of Ascension, will deal with someone having to go to the well and actually deal with that. And that will raise the questions of what happens if the Hero of Ages actually comes about, assuming it wasn't Rashek. Sure. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Vin's status as a Mistborn, because it's not clear how many people are going to know. There's that one noble woman that they pay off to stop telling anyone mm -hmm. but otherwise like while she was a big part of the revolution outside of the main thieving crew most people aren't going to know who she is um so it'll be interesting to see whether she retains some anonymity or whether she is sort of there as a partner to ellen and a known mistborn i think that those are the main ones i have I do think that we're going to learn more about some metals that's the other thing we see some metals that aren't clear what they do in the final empire and where the like the 11th metal yeah the 11th metal seems to sort of be like if gold shows you alternate possibilities of what of who you could be at that point i think the 11th metal shows you alternate possibilities of other people mm -hmm. but it'll be interesting to see if we get something confirmed on that and whether there's an application for those beyond just huh it's interesting mm -hmm. um and I suspect that some part of one of the metals will allow you to communicate with those people in some way. Mm -hmm. And that that might be a way of there being some sort of bizarre communication with a spiritual form of Kelsier. Mm -hmm. I suspect that there'll be some sort of presence of him in a Obi-Wan Kenobi sort of style. Mm -hmm. Like okay. I don't I don't think I can quite go as far as to say that like this is a fantasy book and therefore he's not really dead. Um, they do very much set him up as dead. But if, if this were a movie, I think that maybe the actor would be cashing another check at some point in the future. 
How many metals do you think there ultimately will be explored? I think that there's got to be at least 14. I don't think that the base 10 that they discuss are enough. So the eight that are listed in the back of here are iron, steel, tin, pewter, brass, zinc, copper, and bronze. It does not list... Gold or the 11th metal. Or atium. Or atium. Yeah, gold, atium, and whatever the 11th metal is and the stuff they give Vin to wipe out her metals. So I think gold and um, the 11th metal are paired. That makes sense. I think atium must have another pair, which takes that to 12. And I think that whatever wipes out the metals for Vin must have a pair, which would take it to 14. I don't know what that pair would be, because if there was a metal that just gave you reserves of all the metals, which would be the obvious opposite, then that would be strange. Well, you think about the gold and 11th metal opposite, and it could be an action on someone else. Mm. With the way that gold... A metal that if you burn it, it gets rid of other people's metals. Yeah, which I could see being incredibly useful. It would be. But I, there's also an aspect to which OP. <laughs> if, that, if that's something that could be had, then why would the Inquisitors not have it? So. Mm, yeah, instead of having to feed it to... Or indeed, why would the Lord Ruler not use it? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Like, it, I think if that existed, it would already be in use. We don't know what a Kolos can do, and that might use some metals. So I think at that's least, true. I think there has to be at least 14. There might be more. I think by the third book, there might be more. I think if you tried to include more than the explanations for up to 14 in the next book, it would start getting very messy, and we'd start getting a lot of questions of, okay, how many metals can you keep secret? I mean, I know there's a risk involved in trying a metal that you don't know about, but still. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's my predictions for the next book. There's also a division with the eight, with the eight base between physical and mental. And so there might be some insight there as to what would gold and things count as. It's not exactly like emotional, rather. It was like there's like... The, there's four physical yeah. and four mental. Yeah. But then the other ones are not neatly grouped in that same category. Well, I think you could argue that gold, the 11th metal, atium and its pair could be a sort of spiritual ones mm. in that they produce representations of things. And like time. Yeah. Like they're somehow related to time, I think more than, or like alternate universes rather than specifically someone's spirit. Yeah. Atium's pair would be strange if it showed you what you were about to do. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Or, I, or past. Well, that's what gold is. You're right. To that's do, what gold so. does. We'll, we'll see. Or we won't. I mean, I yeah. don't know what he put in the books. So I think the other thing um, I want to add for predictions would be that we'll see some more stuff about the sort of Vin's family with Reen and her mother, like killing of her younger sister and supposedly going crazy and stuff. I think there's probably a bit more to that story. I feel like there's also some sort of reckoning that needs to happen with the fact that she had her father killed in front of her. Um, regardless of whether she knew him or anything, there's still some sort of element that must be at play in that, assuming that that was her father, but well, I guess we'll see. So I think we've covered all the topics that we want to get into on this book, and we might end up needing to wait on a big question until we finish the trilogy, since it is sort of an entire narrative across three books. But at least as far as this installment, our like moderately big question might be, what is the most important function of religion? You know, the functions of religion and the different ways that people have used it come up several times from Sazed and Kelsier and the engineering of the Lord Ruler and Kelsier of religions in the masses. So what, what do you think the book is trying to say about that? I think it's interesting because the first thing that I would say from a existence in the world perspective is that it would be tempting to say something like brings people together. Especially seeing as how at the end of the book, that's certainly what Kelsey's religion is doing, is it's bringing the Scar to rebel and it's getting them to team up with the nobles in some cases. But I think that doesn't really hold water because of some of the stories of Suzette's about religion. I think there's very much some where there's aspects of like it being a smaller thing and that being fine, being much more of an independent thing that you have a religion um, with the way that he offers them to people as well. Like it doesn't seem to be something where you have to all think the same thing. So I think it can still be a good form of independence there. I think that it 
uh, based on what Suzette says about some of the religions that he offers, it serves to sort of show people a way forward and to uh, give them a path, as it were, a way of understanding things. That makes sense. I think that in this book, particularly the parts that like the conversation Suzette has and the way that Kelsier uses it, religion is a shorthand for your values and a way of reminding yourself of your values when it's difficult to live by them. The Lord Ruler uses it oppressively, though. And it's all about the value of order and keeping everything the same and under his control, which is not necessarily something that's coming from the people. It's something that's being imposed by him and enforced by him with his like soothing stations and things, which is an interesting way that we're seeing it abused to kind of curate a cultural value system from the top down. Um, and I, I, like that juxtaposition where you have Kelsier and Sazed kind of showing different ways, but that it always comes down to these values and sort of distilling something down to these singular ideals that can be very difficult to employ consistently in your everyday life, but are nonetheless important to you. Would you say that's fair? In this book, like the way that those characters are using it and showing the function in society? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I was expecting you to say something more about passion and inspiring, but yes. Yeah. And that's the value that Kelsier puts it to. Yeah. He thinks that it's important for people to stand up for themselves and recognize their dignity and their power. Which I think is an interesting reflection of what he needs to use it against. Which I think is the other thing is that it's what you need it to be when you need it. Mm -hmm. um, the reason Suzette is offering different people different religions is because not everyone, not everyone needs the same thing. Not everyone's in the same position. But when Kelsey is approaching his religion, kind of everyone is in the same position. They're under the thumb of the Lord Ruler and they need to not be. Right. And they need to recognize that and be willing to fight for it. In a similar way to the Lord Ruler, he's trying to impose his value system on other people and engender it in them and keep them moving it forward. But it's in a reactive way to the Lord Ruler, which is honestly very consistent with everything he's doing. He's very reactive as a character to the system that he's in. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see whether any nobles pick up his religion. Hmm. And how Ellen feels about it as well. <laughs> so I think that answers the big question. I think the bigger question is, what is the coolest alimantic power? Like, what's, What would be the best metal if you could only have the one? It's that only having one that's the problem. Because the best pair is obviously iron and steel. Is it? Yes. Why? Because the flying? I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, like, especially when you, like, look at the ability they have to, um, with the road, in quotes, that they have between mm -hmm. Renault's estate and the um, city, mm -hmm. like, where they can get from one place to another very quickly because of it. Yeah, but I mean, the you would only need one to do that, I think. No, you need it for balance. Do you? Yeah, you've got to be able to pull yourself to the sides. Uh, and you, like, it's pushing off of one and pulling on the next one. Gotcha. So it's misborns only. But there's a difference between what is actually the coolest thing and what has been described in the coolest way in the text. And I think that is one of the ones that's described in the coolest way in the text, the way that you can use those two together. Well, copper and bronze clearly aren't in the running because that's just hiding or seeing other people's magic. It is pretty useless on its own. Soothing and writing emotions uh, just have general issues with creepiness yeah like that seems manipulative uh -huh. um and also i mean if you're skilled you can do that with words anyway you don't need magic i'm sticking my tongue out for those listening at home i'm not serious about that mostly tin enhanced senses okay kind of cool sure pewter you can be really strong well you can be really strong anyway if you want to seems like a lot of work but we well, can be really strong without a lot of work <laughs> Sure, I mean, like, being able to run for a really long time would be nice, but I think that the risks that come with it of you hurting yourself because you've gone beyond, it's like taking a pan full of painkillers and then going 12 rounds with someone. Like, great, you don't feel it at the time, you're gonna feel it later. But isn't there also healing that comes with that, like you heal faster? With Peter as well? You do, as long as you keep it burning. If you let it stop, then you die. Yeah. It seems like a lot of risk. And then you have iron and steel. And I think even by themselves, those are the coolest things. Because, I mean, like, effectively, you have, at worst in that situation, limited telekinesis, which everybody wants. Right? Yeah. In this world in particular, in the industrialized world, it's particularly powerful. I mean, it's your magneto, basically. Right. I mean, you even with just one of them, you would be able to pull and push yourself around, which would be kind of cool. The presence of coin shotting mm -hmm. is pretty, like, I mean, effectively, that's a gun, which 
I mean, I don't find the need to walk around with a permanent gun, but if you could throw things at people all the time, that would be fun as someone who loves throwing things at people. I realize that out of context, this sounds like I'm a crazy person, but yeah, you, you do love like rubber bands and stuff like that. Yeah. People who have worked with me in a bookstore know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's fair. Hopefully none of my bosses are listening to this. <laughs> There's a decent chance that if you're buying a book in one of the stores I've worked in, it's been thrown at some point. Carefully, much faster than anything to be. Anyway, um, so I, I think probably steel is the coolest metal. That would probably be the one I'd go for. Iron is very tempting, but I don't know if you can like, I'd have to get a metal coffee cup to be able to pull it over from a distance. I think being able to put things over there is better than bringing it. I don't know, it's just a toss up between the two. Which one do you think? I don't know. There are a lot that are interesting. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that we're not allowing Atium as the answer. Well, sure. That one is sort of like, it's unfair. Like, it's, it burns so quickly, though. Like, it's one of those ones that's just like, you, you could not use it very much. Also, the ethical problems with its provenance, like... Right. Well, I mean, I'm assuming that if we're talking about it being in this world, then you would be able to get a decent supply of any item from an ethical source. I don't know why I would assume no, that. No, considering the unethical but, I mean, sourcing for, of a lot of For the of sake of this here. conversation. Like. Yeah. yeah, I forgot about Atam somehow. I think that the 11th medal is really cool. Just like being able to see what other people might have been. Assuming that is what it does. Or gold like yourself. I don't know. I think gold could just be annoying or upsetting. Oh, it could definitely be upsetting. I'm sure I can definitely see that, but... Uh... I think there are a lot of interesting questions to ask, especially like the metaphysical or spiritual, whatever ones. I think you go crazy like that. Yeah, maybe. The enhanced senses is very appealing too. It is all of them or is it just your vision? I don't think it's it, just your vision. It's category. all of them because people mm -hmm. yell at her when she's burning tin occasionally mm -hmm. and it startles her. Um, I yeah. mean, I, I guess that you can guess which one of us has got the worst glasses prescription. It's... Yeah, I think that would be really cool. Also, because like I know that there are a lot of species that see in different spectrums than humans do. Yeah, but there's no evidence of that. There is no evidence that that does, but... It doesn't give you new tones. It just makes the ones you have more efficient. Yeah, yeah. I can't decide. I think there are a lot of really interesting ones. I don't think that one immediately stands out. So it was maybe unfair of me to ask you which one's the coolest one. I could see some like therapeutic potential with the emotion-altering ones and with the like gold and 11th metal stuff. I've considered it. I'd go with iron. Yeah. You can pull things towards you so you don't have mm -hmm. to get up. Mm -hmm. And also if you want to move around, you can pull yourself towards things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, especially... Like towards really stable, large sources of metal. Yeah. Well, you don't have the risk of like pushing off of something on the ground and then it and then losing track of it or something. Mm -hmm. And also we live in a world with cars. Mm -hmm. So as far as traveling goes, you could pull on cars. And, and they're plenty heavy to stay put when you pull on them. Yeah. We have enough metal that like you could effectively go down the interstate faster than a car. Mm, yeah. And just pull back on a road barrier or something where you need to slow down. Or a rebar in some concrete building, or a rebar in skyscrapers and stuff. Yeah, so I am. It's very practical of you. Yes. <laughs> no, I definitely see the temptation. I also like, like, I'm also drawn toward things like teleportation and stuff like that. But I don't know, there's just some interesting, like, unexplored areas with some of the emotional and spiritual metals that are interesting and of course the enhanced senses i think would be pretty cool too a lot of them are you think are yeah, i'm also vaguely aware that when you say practical you mean boring uh. <laughs> no i mean it is practical and i do see the appeal i do i also tend to gravitate in that direction but i don't know i think it's harder than that do i have to pick one no i don't think so Okay. Shall we leave it there for today? Well, I was wondering if you wanted to include Furukami in this. I did ask about element. Well, I was one. thinking that, like, I think I think I might actually pick Furukami if I had a choice, mm. if that was an option. Okay. It does seem to be that with Furukami, you can do stuff with lots of different metals and, like, save different things in different ones. And so it's a lot more versatile than being an Alamancer of one metal. The thing it's the more like being a Mistborn. But... The difference being that it all has to come from within. Yeah. You can't store something you don't have. Yeah. There's a lot of discipline wrapped up in Furukumi. And I think between the two, I agree with you. I think I would probably prefer Furukumi over Alamancy because it is so much more versatile and you have a lot more control over what you want to do with it. Yeah. So we agree. Furukumi yes. is the best. There is no best Alamantic metal. There is Furukumi. Yes. Combine it with Alamancy and then you've got everything you possibly need. Well, and then you have everything you need to become a despotic lord ruler. <laughs> that is one of many optional paths. It's like, no, 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 no. I just want to be God. <laughs>
Okay, we do have a late thought from our episode on Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, we discussed the White Lotus Society and mm -hmm. what the symbol of the White Lotus meant. What we found out later is that there actually was a White Lotus Society. Didn't I post that in the show notes? I don't know. You asked me to put it down for late thoughts, so I put it down for late thoughts. I think that I did, but the White Lotus Society not only existed, but was behind a bunch of rebellions in China. So like, there's some pretty like direct parallels and inspiration that I'm sure is not a coincidence. Another late thought that we have is for Hamilton. Um, we watched the Bernadette Banner episode on the fashion, on the costuming in Hamilton, and I definitely recommend that people who are interested in that Go and check that out because we were talking about how the changing costumes kind of was relevant to characterization and building people up as like important characters. But in Bernadette Banner's video, she points out that the costume designers used changes in costuming to show the progression of time. And you can see that the actual styles and silhouettes that the cast members change into are consistent with the change in time across the turn of the century. So that's really interesting and neat. And we'll put that in the show notes. Another thing that we wanted to point out to people is that we forgot to mention in a previous episode in our Harley Quinn episode. Which was like eight episodes was, ago. Yeah, quite a while ago. I wanted to talk about the Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend number in that and how that scene shows the way that Harley Quinn has coped with traumatic experiences in her life by dissociating and retreating into her own like sort of mental fantasy world. She does it when Roman hits her in the face. And you also see that she's kind of got these sort of mental blocks in her mind as far as the Joker. It's consistent with the way that she's telling the story of the breakup and things like that, or the way that she's unreliable. Um, but it's an important and very realistic coping mechanism that I thought was really well done. And there's a really awesome blog post, I think on tour.com that we shared on our Facebook page not too long ago. That we'll also probably link in the show notes that goes into some more details on why that musical number is really great. Okay, we finally managed to remember to do late thoughts. That's pretty exciting. Yay, go us. Uh, that is it for us for this week. We are starting a YouTube channel where we will be posting all of our older episodes and we'll also be posting new episodes as they come out with some slideshows just to make it a little bit more accessible to people. Um, so please do go over there, hit subscribe and keep an eye on those as they come up. It's a fun way to be able to listen to them while you're at your desk. You can, as usual, find us on our social media across the internet. You can find the links to that in the show notes, along with our email address, where you can send us any questions, suggestions, requests for upcoming episodes, all that sort of thing. Thanks for listening to Unramblings. We hope you'll join us next time. But I think the bigger question is... What is Misty doing in that bag? Yeah. She's waiting for her dinner. Yeah. That's what she's doing in the bag. Ooh. Maybe she knows if she makes enough noise, we'll feed her. <laughs>